Hello and welcome to Access Asia. I'm Delon D'Souza. Coming up on the show this week. China's former top premier, Li Keqiang, passes away of a sudden heart attack in Shanghai. His death comes on the same week three high-profile ministers were sacked. Victims' families in South Korea still searching for justice a year after a deadly Halloween crush killed over 150 people in Seoul. And doctors in India warning of health risks as air quality worsens in the country's big cities. Residents in New Delhi and Mumbai say it's now difficult to breathe. But first, uh, former Chinese Premier Lei Keqiang has passed away at the age of 68. According to state media, he died of a sudden heart attack. He stepped down from his role earlier this year. He was once tipped to be the country's future leader, but was overtaken by Xi Jinping. News of his death comes on the same week that China's defense minister was sacked. Li Shangfu was shown the door after a two-month disappearance. The country's science and technology minister and finance minister were also fired this week. We can now bring in Dr. Zeno Leone, lecturer in defense studies at King's College London and author of A Grand Strategy and the Rise of China Made in America. Thank you very much for joining us here on the program today. Now, China's defense minister was only in the job since March. Why was he sacked? Well, I suspect we will never know uh, uh, the reason why this is happening um, and, and why also Qinggang uh, was, was sacked a, a few weeks ago. There were different rumors about different stories. None of them seemed so substantial, so important. But I suspect that while us as Westerners um, give a lot of importance to this, to this subject, it's possible that we will never find out because the, the, the elite of the Chinese Communist Party doesn't feel the urge or the need to uh, explain to the rest of the world what is happening. They see this very much as an internal issue. An internal issue, but we've also seen the finance minister, the science and technology minister. And then in uh, July, we saw the, the foreign minister who was sacked after a one month disappearance. Is this part of some larger purge? Uh, well, it's uh, it's difficult to say. We've seen um, uh, this sort of uh, purges uh, in the past, especially in the context of Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign, but we have never seen uh, a, a bigger uh, reshuffling within government um, in the way that it is happening now, which seems to be happening uh, through an approach of rule by whim, the whim of of the of, of the leader in charge. There used to be in the past. There used to be a process when a reshuffling in government uh, was uh, happening. So it's it, it's difficult to say. I think we're looking at something new, uh, nonetheless. You were talking about whims. Weren't these people picked by Xi Jinping? Yes, they were. Um, but I think. And if we look back at the fact that at the moment there is not a replacement. Uh, for uh, Li Shangfu, and the replacement for Qinggang was the previous uh, foreign minister, uh, Wang Yi. It makes me think that, on the one hand, uh, Xi Jinping is um, uh, feels like he cannot trust anymore people around him, even those who are very close to him. Or, on the other hand, it's possible that, uh, that there are there is a lack of, of volunteers. Uh, of, of people in the party who wants to take these sort of top jobs, which doesn't look good for the uh, uh, leadership of the party. Is he trying to consolidate more power? Um, I, I suspect so. I mean, we could look at it through two different lenses. On the one hand, he feels sort of paranoid, and so he's getting rid of people who used to trust and all of a sudden doesn't trust anymore. Or on the other hand, he's acting based on the fact that he feels very powerful. And he is powerful, especially very powerful, powerful since last year, um, uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, Congress. I think he's becoming he, he, the, uh, the victim of its, his own uh, uh, power, uh, so to speak. What do you make of the timing of all these firings? How are things going for China on the domestic front since uh, it loosened those COVID restrictions? I think China is facing a very delicate moment. Uh, slowing growth, youth unemployment, 
and is also facing potentially a massive um, uh, estate, real estate uh, crisis. I think at this time is, it is extremely important that the Communist Party, which relies on consensus, probably even more than our parties in, in domestic, in, in democratic countries, is really important that, um, that the government and the party looks efficient, that there are not scandals, and if there are scandals or suspects of scandals, those are dealt with very uh, quickly because uh, the party cannot afford to uh, lose consensus at this specific moment. Dr. Uh, Zeno Leone, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Thank you. Now, it's been a year since a fun Halloween night out in Seoul turned deadly. This after a crowd surge killed 150 people and injured close to 200 others. A lack of preparation and lax crowd control measures were to blame. The disaster was one of the worst in South Korea's modern history, and a year on, the anger still lingers. Jenny Shin reports. Lee Nam Hoon was just 29 years old when he lost his life last year. Like tens of thousands of others, he'd gone out to enjoy Halloween, South Korea's first post-pandemic holiday. But the night quickly descended into a nightmare. The build-up of crowds in the narrow alleyways of Itaewon became deadly, suffocating more than 150 people to death. A year on, Lee's mother still cannot bring herself to open the door to her son's room. <laughs> When the day finally comes, I'll open his room and tell him to rest in peace. I'll take out all the anger from my heart and cry it out on his bed. I hope the day will come soon. She's angry and frustrated at the government for its handling of the disaster and the lack of accountability. And she's not alone. For the victims' families, the pain of losing their loved ones is still fresh. The site of the disaster, now designated Memorial Alley, is a place of remembrance for the bereaved. Its walls decorated with hundreds of paper notes filled with messages of grief and tribute. In addition to remembrance and mourning, we want this place to be a space of safety. For this year's Halloween, the Seoul Metropolitan Government conducted crowd control drills, testing a new safety system. With over 900 CCTV cameras in over 70 major locations, the early warning system uses AI technology to analyze crowd movement and alert authorities for signs of danger. We conducted this drill focusing on how to protect citizens in crowds by monitoring the situation in real time with the assistance of cutting-edge technology. This can determine whether it's a potentially dangerous situation by calculating the number of people per square meter. Itaewon is a bustling neighborhood full of bars and restaurants where many in their 20s and 30s celebrate Halloween each year. And yet the lack of preparation and police presence, as well as initial calls for help that went unanswered, are just some of the factors being blamed for the disaster. Despite a formal investigation and ongoing prosecutions of local officials, not a single person has yet been legally sanctioned. Victims' relatives and activists are now calling for an independent investigation into what went wrong and who's responsible. Pollution levels in parts of India are on the rise. Stubble burning in states surrounding the capital are to blame for a new Delhi shrouded in smog. Over in the financial capital, Mumbai, residents say it's difficult to breathe as the air quality in India continues to worsen. Doctors are warning of health risks. Emerald Maxwell reports. It's regularly voted the world's most polluted capital. And this time of year is particularly toxic. As winter approaches, pollution is only increasing. Also, there are so many vehicles. Construction is going on in full swing. All these are adding to pollution in Delhi. Even normal walking is not easy. Air quality deteriorated further this week, leaving residents with itchy eyes and trouble breathing. I always keep my mask handy. The coronavirus has gone, but there's still pollution. So I think we should all make this a habit amid the rising pollution. Winter in New Delhi comes with a thick layer of smog. 
as cold, heavy air traps vehicle emissions, smoke and dust. The pollution grows still more intense in October and November due to crop burning to clear the fields after harvest. A practice that was banned in several states in 2015, but has proved hard to enforce. The result is particularly high levels of fine particulate matter, PM2.5, which can cause serious ailments. Effects of air pollution can be on a lot of organ systems, not just the lungs and heart. So there are a lot of patients in whom attributable mortality is due to air pollution. So it is a big health risk. Medical journal The Lancet reported in 2019 that air pollution was responsible for almost one in five of all fatalities in India. The New Delhi government has been encouraging residents to use public transport while increasing the availability of electric buses and metro trains. But the problem is getting worse and spreading to places that were previously spared, like the coastal city of Mumbai, which last year recorded air quality worse than that of New Delhi on at least one day in December. Now a couple in Taiwan picked an unusual spot to take their wedding photos. Greenpeace campaigner Iris Xu and her fiancé traveled three hours to pose in front of a giant pile of trash. The bride, hoping her actions discourage her wedding guests from generating unnecessary waste. The town where the photos were taken witnesses around 50 tons of garbage dumped every single day. That's it for this edition of Access Asia. From all of us on the team, thank you very much for watching.